Welcome to the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, silly, strange, and sublime aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men who are the go-to parents aren't always accepted at work, among their friends, or in their community for what they're doing. I'm your host, Paul Sullivan. Today, my guest is Bill Masters, acclaimed comedy writer, Hollywood husband, and lead dad. He's written and produced shows like Grace Under Fire, Carolina and City, and for this podcast, the aptly named Raising Dad. Bill also wrote for Seinfeld. His wife is Gail Berman, who was the first woman to run both a film studio, Paramount, and a television network, Fox's entertainment division. She's also the successful producer of such classics as Malcolm in the Middle and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Her recent productions, which are up for many awards, include the movie Elvis and Wednesday, the Netflix series. Bill and Gail have twins, Alex and Jacob, who recently turned 30. Bill, welcome to the Company Dads podcast. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Good to see you. All right. So you've had great success uh, as a sitcom writer. Here's a chicken and egg question. You know, what helped, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, being married, being a father or, you know, being a comedy writer feel uh, sort of feed your ability to uh, manage the, the ups and downs of, of parenting? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I started out as a stand up comic. So the first uh, 10 years of uh my uh, married life to Gail, um, you know, we didn't have kids and I was uh, on the road a lot and I was just doing stand up and um, we wanted children, but um, we just never seemed, you know, we, we never seemed to be in the same building, you know? And so uh, uh, I wrote a, uh, I was working on the Cosby show and I wrote a script uh, that they really liked. And I said, okay, I should do, maybe I'll try this. And then I wrote a feature that got uh, set up and another feature that got bought and that sent us out to LA. Um, and Gail was a theater producer in the beginning of, uh, of her career. And, and she came out here and started working in television. Um, and then we decided, you know, now's the time to start the family. Um, and, you know, we were older, I mean, not that old, but, uh, you know, we weren't the, uh, you know, teenagers, uh, <laughs> But we managed to, uh, uh, Gail managed to get pregnant. And the interesting thing is that um, I had written an episode of Seinfeld. Um, and because I knew Larry and I knew Jerry from the stand up world, and they did a freelance script for me. And um, I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I, my, I, I'm, my career is really going to start to move. And um, I couldn't get a job anywhere. And Gail and I went to, she was working for Sandy Gallen at the time um, and uh, and Dolly Parton and um, and Sandy was tough. And anyway, we, we went to the uh, uh, the obstetrician who said that she was pregnant with twins and that there's going to be some um, bed rest and, you know, it's sure. not, not going to be that easy. And I, my first thought was, well, she's, Sandy's going to fire her, you know, he's, he's not he's not that family guy. <laughs> um, and I had just had two meetings with writers who said no, that they didn't want to hire me. So I went to Gail's office on the Fox lot and, um, I didn't know what I was going to do because I hadn't done stand up in about a year. I'm not fit to really do anything else. <laughs> uh, and I called home to get messages and I got a message from, uh, from Larry David, uh, who was in New York. And Gail said, do we have any messages? I said, uh, Larry David called, but I'm not calling him back. <laughs> she said, why not? I said, because I know he's in New York. He's going to ask me to ask you to get tickets for Les Mis or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's just really going to piss me off because <laughs> I'm struggling here. And she said, call him. I'll get him tickets. Don't worry. So anyway, uh, I called him and he said, look, I, you may not want to do this, but uh I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about hiring you for the staff next season. And, and before he got that out, did you say, no, Larry, no, you can't have tickets to Les Mis. Oh, thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, he, he, so he, he, he gave me that job. And the great thing about Seinfeld was that was a year that arguably the best year of Seinfeld uh, season four. So what uh, that's like 90, 91 or what are we talking about? This was uh, 
this was uh, 92, 93. 92, 93, yeah. So it was the one, you know, it was a year with the, uh, you know, the the contest, the implant, the uh, um, the Virgin, you know, a, a lot of great episodes, none of which, I mean, I had something to do with, but none of, I, yeah. you know, it wasn't because of me, but anyway, I just happened to be there. And so, um, and Larry always had a, a, he he very rarely kept the writers for more than one year. He ended up changing it once they became the number one show. And that was the year that we uh, Seinfeld moved to Thursdays and became the big hit. Yeah. Anyway, I had that under my belt, the Seinfeld uh, credit. And so I was able to uh, continue to work and and sort of have had some choices as to where I was going to work for about the next 10 years. But that, uh, that, that time also sort of coincides. I'm doing some math. Kids just turned 30. So your kids are born at the end of... 1992. So, you know, Grace Under Fire is 93. Carolyn in the City's, you know, uh, 95. Um, how did you and Gail sort of trade off that balance? And, and she's obviously working as well. How did you trade off that that balance of of parenting when the twins were, were so young, when you were, you both, you know, not just quite busy, but but having, you know, s- some real success, the type of success that yeah, you, you well, work hard for? You know, on one hand, it was really good because it was a, a time where we were both making money, um, and that was that was good. Better to make money than not make money. Is that exactly. the deal? Yeah. So we we ended up buying a house, and and um, after Seinfeld, it was Grace Under Fire, which was for two years an unbelievably hard, time consuming job, um, where I had to put in sometimes over a hundred hours a week, uh, you know, in the writers' room and on the set. And during that time, the kids were uh, one, two. Gail did almost all the heavy lifting back then. And, and even to the point where the mommy and me class had started, I guess, when they were two or three, yeah. uh, she would do that. She would go to the classes with the kids, uh, take them home. We ha- we did have a nanny. Uh, and then she would go to work. And every night, and I mean every night, uh, she had to get home to put the kids to bed because I wasn't going to get home until, you know, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, But I would always get up at six with the kids uh, just so I could spend time with them. So for the first couple of years, it was a real give and take between the two of us. Um, And Gail had a job where she could at least make sure that she could get home most nights, you know, weekends, all we did was just, you know, we played with the kids and whenever they took a nap, we took a nap. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we spent we spent a lot of time uh, doing that, uh, um, you know, uh, raising the kids together. And like I said, in the beginning, it was it was mostly Gail who was uh, hands on. Um, then, you know, as the years went by, uh, when Gail's career changed from being uh, working for a company, producing yeah. for another company uh she got the job uh at fox right I, let's pause but I, I want to get to that yeah. in a second i want to come back because i want to paint a picture for people who are listening to this particularly you know people who are in their 30s are going to say well why couldn't you just do this or do this i mean paint the picture of a writer's room in the 1990s oh. i mean you, you, there are no iphones uh limited computers you everybody is in there together and, and paint the picture of what was going on and wh- why you had to be there. Why was there was no such thing as, you know, remote work back then. Right. Well, the interesting thing in the beginning, it was, uh, Larry didn't have a writer's room except on occasion when they were in real trouble. And when then we would come in. So my first year I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't, but, but as soon as I got into grace under fire, Chuck Laurie, that's how he was raised in television and it's the way most television shows are. And everyone after that was, that was basically you get to work um, and you get into a room and you start working on something. And usually at any given day, there's a, uh, an episode that's being edited and, and uh, prepped for being on television. The one that you did, before is going to be on television that week. The uh, one that they're rehearsing is the one that's going to be on television in a couple of weeks. And then the one that you're writing is going to be. So 
there's a, a lot of work that you have to do. And it, this conveyor belt, it always keeps on moving. It always yeah. keeps moving and you, and you can, um, you know, you, a couple of you might have to work on, on this, what's happening exactly now. You got to run down to the set and put that fire out. And right. um, so it's, it's a constant, uh, it, it's, it's constantly working on a bunch of different things. And the showrunner is the, it all falls on his or her head. And it's, it's an impossible, I just did it briefly uh, for pilots and stuff. It's, it's, it's amazing how, how hard that job is and how time consuming it is. Uh, and so uh, that's why, you know, every time we, that I'd, I'd leave there, wherever, whatever show it was, uh, I'd have to be back, you know, in six hours or at the most, you know, yeah. and, and uh, while you're there, but not only do you have this work to do, but you also have to have some kind of creative thing. Going you gotta be on. funny. You're there to be funny. You can't come in tired and morose and yeah, exactly. And the great thing about um, my experience, uh, not only is uh, being a stand up, but also uh, as I stayed, uh, got different jobs in sitcoms, um, I need other people to be funny. And that's, a, that's, yeah. you know, if, if I was stuck in my room and I'm writing a script, it's not going to be as funny as if I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of other people who are funny people. Yeah. Because funny people make other funny people funny. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really true. Uh, and it's also, I, I, I want that on a t-shirt. Uh, that's good. <laughs> and, and it's also, you know, um, there's a certain amount of competition and, yeah. uh, but you have to get rid of the fear immediately. And, you know, I worked on uh, second year of Grace Under Fire, Alan Ball, mm -hmm. who, who was going to be a big, big uh, star in the business. That was his first job. And for the first couple of months, he almost said nothing in the room. He just sat there and, um, you know, he was the lowest writer. So it didn't matter to anybody. Whether he <laughs> Nobody would listen to him anyway. So, but yeah. Right. And then, you know, about the, about six weeks in, he just started to just say stuff and almost everything he said helped the script or was put in the script or started the script. I mean, he, he just spent that first six weeks watching everything and seeing how it was done and saying, I can do this. And then he did it. And, you know, I mean, at, by the end of the season, we were all so excited uh, that Alan was still there because uh, he was so good. Yeah, uh, we all knew he was gonna, you know, he was gonna become something. Yeah. All right, I want to get back to what you're about. You're about to talk about Gail and what happened with her at Paramount Fox. But before that, uh, you know, that was all the early 2000s. But before that, you know, you came on the Company of Dads podcast and not talk about, you know, raising dad. I mean, how, how did that, you know, how did it come about? Well, uh, you can talk the about interesting you know, thing, yeah. Interesting thing about raising dad was, um, I'm, I had stopped working full time. Uh, I was just going to write some pilots. We didn't really need the money. Plus, uh, as I was getting to before, Gail was in a position where she she didn't have the flexibility. Yeah. She was when she was running Fox. She would get a. Um, she call me up and say, uh, uh, you know, I've got a, uh, I've got uh, Peter Turner wants me to come to his house to do, and I, she has to do it. That's more important than me being on a TV show mm -hmm. in, the, in the writers' room. So. Uh, we agreed that I wouldn't work for that, at least that one year or two years. Um, and about the second year. Um, I mean, what were you doing that, that, that one or two years? Were you well, I had a deal one year. I was lucky. I had a deal at, at, at Warner Brothers. So I got paid and I was writing a, a pilot. I was I was spending one one night a week on a show. Huh. Um, so I was still in it. And then the next year, my friend Peter had a show and I co-executive executive, uh, produced that. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't go uh, after the the first 13. But it wasn't uh, the intensity that. of being on a, a, a series in the writer's room. It was right. just it was just easier. And then um, then I just, you know, because I had a good agent and and I I would get meetings. I'd go to meetings. I'd pitch ideas. People would buy the pilot. I'd stay at home and write the pilot. But I was on I had my own I was on my own clock, you know, yeah, put down my pen and go, you know, pick up the kids after school and that kind of stuff. And um, and then Raising Dad, the reason uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, it was his show and we were friends from um, from doing stand up. And so he called me up and he said uh, they just cast Bob Saget. Yeah. 
Now, Saget's daughter was in school with my kids. Oh. So I would see Bob. I also did stand up with Bob. So we knew each other from, from the back in the day. Yeah. Um, so when I got the job for raising dad, um, you know, I was really happy to go back to work. I said to Gail, you know, I, it's, it's going to be good, you know, to get, to get back and, and do this again, um, full time. And, uh, I met Norman Steinberg, who's a, a legend, you know, wrote blazing saddles yeah. and we got along great. And so, uh, we started working on raising dad and I think I'm, I'm looking around the room in my mind besides Norman and I, I don't think there were any other dads in there, <laughs> you know, uh, because uh so does that give you guys veto power if you said it like hey we're, we're dads we've got some credit and you guys don't no i i don't think any you know that's the one thing about the writer's room is uh yeah. funny rules yeah whoever's 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 the funniest doesn't make any difference um uh so anyway that's how i got that job and and you know we did a season and then they didn't pick it up for the next year and i i we were all disappointed because we thought it was it was good enough uh it was the WB and they needed hits and, uh, the, you know, the show to get picked up. And so that was my only real experience of being on a show, um, you know, that I, that I really thought, God, you know, this, 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 the show, uh, the show should have about a five or six year, uh, you know, uh, run and it didn't. Um, and then obviously the tragedy of Bob, uh, dying last year. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know, he was a dad and he had these, he has, he has three daughters. And when he come in the room, we would all talk about, you know, raising, raising our kids. And, and he had a similar life, except he obviously was a, a lot more successful, but you know, he, he didn't have a working wife, but he, he had these three kids earlier, uh, was on the road as a comic. Then he was doing, uh, a bunch of, he had two shows on the air at the same time back in the nineties uh, or the two thousands. Um, and so, uh, you know, his, his whole idea of, of, uh, raising dad was, he was almost like, you know, he'd get together with the kids on Saturday and all they would do was eat ice cream and go to the <laughs> zoo, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, so I, I think, and my kids at that time were about, I guess about 10 or 11. Yeah. Yeah. Nine or like 10, that, yeah. 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 Uh, so that was, that was a good experience. Um, and, and I was really at that time, full-time dad, uh, the, the number one uh, parent, as far as dealing with the kids issues. Uh, we had a, uh, this is kind of funny. Uh, during that year, the kids were going to the La Brea tar pits for a, a class, you know, outing field trip. And so the parents that volunteered, so they were like, I don't know, let's say there were four moms and me. And as we we're going to the, uh, on the bus, the teacher is assigning p uh, kids yeah. and would say to the woman, okay, you know, these are, these are the four kids you're going to watch. She said, and then when she got to me, she said, I want you to watch Timmy. And then she went to the next person. And then after it was over that, I said, you know, just because I'm not a mom, I can handle more than one kid. One. Yeah. She said, no, no, you don't understand. You'll know <laughs> what I mean when we get there. <laughs> and then we get off the bus. Timmy immediately runs under the velvet rope. He's jumping on top of the, the, the dinosaur. And I spent my whole day wrangling Timmy. And then <laughs> afterwards she said, see that that's why you could only do Timmy. I said, okay, you that's You got, you got Timmy. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about the, the arc of your career and the arc of Gales, it, it seems like it, it kind of overlaps. Like er, early on when you had kids, uh, you you had super structured, you, you had to be there and she had a little more flexibility. And then it, it, it sort of tilt. And we talk about this a lot at the company of dads that the person who's the lead parent, the lead dad, the lead mom, it's not always forever. You know, circumstances intervene and it and it and it changes. When she started getting the you know, Paramount Fox, the, those jobs, you know, studio jobs where, you know, you, you're the big boss, not that producing uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is e easy in any way, but you surely own your own time a little bit better as opposed to when you're the big boss. You, you, you don't. What was the conversation like and, and how did you decide like, okay, you know, I can still do the stuff that fulfills me. Uh, l l let's have this s switch in who's going to be the lead parent or the switch in whose career is going to, you know, take, take priority. Well, one of the, one of the things is, um, 
we both really love being parents. So mm. it wasn't a sort of the, uh, you know, the consolation prize to be the parent and not, and to give up the career. It was sort of like, especially my case, look, I, I, uh, I didn't love being in the writer's room after 10 years of it, but I still wanted to write, which I did. Yeah. And so I was able to, to, to still do that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Gail would, would, you know, would come home and she would bemoan her fate because she missed, you know, she missed the soccer game. She, she wasn't able to see the, uh, the, uh, the performance that they were doing at school because she had work to do. So uh, it, we, we would always try to make sure that the, that when I was the lead parent, if, if and that's a misnomer too, but that we, that she got her time when she could as best as she could and, you know, it was a give and take, I, you know, I would let her do stuff with the kids um, and, uh, you know, and she would do the same for me. So, uh, and, you know, being a parent, it, it's, it, even though you don't necessarily know it at the time, it's, man, it's a fleeting amount of time when you have these kids. And, uh, you know, every time there's a birthday, you go, gee, what, where'd the year go? Yeah. And, um so I think we both, you know, we relish the time to be with the kids. And even though our careers were important to us, uh, we, you know, we kind of, we had the priorities straight. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You, you talked about, you joked about going to the Brea Tar Pits with, with, with Timmy, but you know, I have this vision of LA, you know, the times I've been there, some friends who've, you know, had great success out there. Some friends who have had, you know, okay success out there, but even if you're the most successful uh, A-list actor uh, in the world, you're really only working a couple months a year. You know, nobody is going to a job every single day and, and you know, c series get canceled. The, given that sort of flexibility around, you know, work in LA or the, the acknowledgement that you're not always going to be working a nine to five job like you might be in New York City, was it a more accepting, you know, town to be the, the primary parent, to, to be that go-to dad who was, taking the kids around or is it still very much a place where, you know, the caregivers were, were moms or, or, or nannies? Well, I, I think not only is, is it more typical of, of other places, but, you know, Gail in the beginning when she was doing the mommy and me class, um, most of the moms were stay at home moms. Hmm. And there was a little bit of prejudice between them and working moms. And there was only Gail and maybe one other one. Um, who would you know would, would just the, the traditional mom being at home was where these people were and some of them were in i guess in show business so they maybe their husbands were or they were taking some time off or something but the one thing about show business is it it's it's really hard work and it, yeah. and it is time consuming and with the exception of actors who you can see oh they only worked you know six weeks last year you know, the other 46 weeks, they were working on trying to get work. Mm. And uh, same with writers, same with producers, same with the executives. Um, you don't, you, you, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of time where you're thinking about your job when you're, and that's another thing about raising kids is that um, you have to pay attention to the kids because it, as a writer, I could easily miss out on whatever they're I'm in my own head thinking about an idea that I want to develop and blah, blah, blah. You know, so um, it, it's, it, it's a, it is really a time consuming job uh, as far as the way you use your head. Yeah. I can see that. Like your kids are on the playground and you're thinking about this script that you're working on. You're mulling it. Next thing you know, right. one of the you're kids is falling off the head. jungle gym. Yeah. Yeah. I, I met some dads who were, you know, I'll tell you another funny thing when the kids were small uh, uh, they were uh they one of their classmates was uh uh tom cruise and nicole kidman's daughter uh bella oh. and um you know it was I, I had to talk to the teacher the kid it was a uh, kindergarten i think i had to talk to the teacher and get to work and i got there and i'm looking at her and she's talking to tom cruise <laughs> and i'm like well i can't interrupt and she doesn't want to talk to me it doesn't <laughs> He's talking to Tom Cruise, you know, <laughs> and um, but during that year, I saw Tom as much as I saw. And not that, you know, not that he has a clue who I am even then. Yeah, uh, I don't think he ever knew my name, but uh, 
you know, Thanksgiving, I, I came in there to do the thing and Tom walked in with a big thing of sweet potatoes, you know, for the, for the thing. So uh, having a parent be um, um, the, the go-to parent being a male uh, is, is something that, and I don't know, maybe it's better in, in a world of show business or, or not. I mean, but uh, you know, we saw, like I said, in Saget too, we, you know, we just, we were in a lot of things together. Yeah. Uh, and, and our wives were elsewhere. Yeah. I, I just think Saget, and I remember, you know, uh, so, some of his stand up routines for, from back in the day, they, they weren't always sort of uh, appropriate for kids. Wow. I mean, they, they're wildly funny, but not appropriate for kids. So I can't imagine he was testing out any bits in like kindergarten. Uh, no. Well, what he would do is while the kids are playing in kindergarten, he and 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 the rest of uh, uh, the dad standing around, he would say disgusting things <laughs> that you were embarrassed to laugh at, because uh, that's just where his his humor was, you know. Um, but uh, that's yeah, anyway, that that uh, that that was uh, that was Bob. I mean, so I had to ask this question. So <clears throat> last year I spoke uh, on a podcast with uh, this great guy named J.R. Havlin. Um, he was an Emmy Award winning writer for The Daily Show when, when Jon Stewart was, was the host. And, um, you know, I, I joke with him if being a comedy writer made being a parent any easier because there's parts of parenting that, of course, are incredibly tedious. And, and he snapped right back and he said, you know, yeah, it might have helped me if my kids were smart enough to get the jokes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was, of course, a perfect, you know, comeback. I mean, did you ever, you know, take parenting lessons, you know, did, did being, a, you know, a, a comedian, like stand up for comedian first, being, you know, a sitcom writer, did, did you ever take, did any of that ever sort of infuse your ability to take a step back with, you know, your kids fighting, the teenage years, the, the, the tedium of parenting? Were you able to joke about it in a way that perhaps, you know, less funny parents uh, might, might struggle with? I, I think... I think I certainly entertained my kids with jokes in order to uh, compensate for the other shortcomings I had. Um, I have a, I tell you a story. I, I don't even know if it's good for the podcast, so you might have to edit it. But anyway, it was um, my daughter, who is now a doctor, um, when she uh, started to have her period. So she started, she didn't tell me anything. She told Gail. And she, Gail said, don't say anything to her because I know she wants to tell you, but she wants to tell you whenever the time is right for her. I said, okay. And then my son, Jacob, who, again, he's, you know, it's like 12 or something. He mentioned it to me. I'm going, wait a minute. Everybody, everybody <laughs> in the country knows except me. So one Saturday, I could see them talking at the table and then they called me over and, and I knew that she was, she says, daddy, guess what? I, I started having my period. So I, I I have no idea what, what, a, what a father is supposed to do at this point. I know that when that Gail knows what to do, cause she went through it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the first, the first thing I thought of was a joke that I know. <laughs> so uh, it was about a woman in the South who was having trouble, female trouble. So she goes to the doctor and she says, doctor, I'm ha again with the Southern accent, I'm having some trouble down there. Um, and he says, well, what kind of flow do you have? And she said, linoleum, what's that got to do with it? So Gail, of course, rolls her eyes. Yeah. And Alex looks at me real serious and she goes, what's linoleum? <laughs> <laughs> so not only didn't the joke work, but it was so funny bit that I had to then explain to her the, what linoleum flooring used to be and how it has absolutely nothing to do with do what, we're talking, what about. we're talking about here on words and flow and floor. And, and at, at which point she had walked away from you. Come on, tell, exactly. tell the joke. She had had enough. Uh, Cause as soon as you start explaining a joke, it, it, it's just, you're just admitting defeat anyway. So Bill, uh, uh this has been great, Bill. Thank you for being my guest today on the company. Oh, well, thank Genesis you. This is podcast. great. Uh, any last thoughts, any last tips, you know, you, you've seen the whole movie up to age 30. Any, any last tips uh, as, as a comedy writer, as a dad to help other, you know, lead dads out there? Well, I got to say, I mean, I really do think that, that, that humor is, is as important as anything else. You know, we talk about safety with your kids and, and, and obviously that's a, that's the number one thing for so long is to make sure they're safe. Uh, but, you know, make sure they're smiling and laughing. And if you can do that, 
not only it makes it better for them and for you, but then when you get to be my age, they'll still want to hang out with you, you know? And, and, and in occasion, you bring up linoleum, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again, Bill. Well, this has been well, great. Well, thank you. This was great. I can't wait to hear it. Hey, thanks for listening to Company of Dads podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but I'm here to tell you it's just one of the many offerings we have at the Company of Dads. We've got another podcast. We have a weekly newsletter. We have various features. We have events that we put on both online and in person. If you want to know about all of those, the best place to learn about them is to go to thecompanyofdads.com backslash the dad. That's the company of dads dot com backslash the dad what do you get if you do that that's how you sign up for our weekly newsletter the dad which is a one-stop shop for all things the dad thank you again for listening 